is Dr. Laura Rademacher, but uh, first things first, I want to acknowledge that this is unseen in Liverpool in every country, and I want to pay my respects to their elders. Uh, I also want to thank all the collaborating scholars that have been part of the Laureate. Uh, it's been a real highlight, especially for me, uh, working with people from diverse disciplines from around the place. And you'll, I guess you'll get a taste of that in this session, hearing from uh, Daniel Lutz Mayo. Um, another highlight of the Laureate was we had the opportunity to go to Harvard in 2019 for our uh, symposium, Deep History Cities. And that symposium really laid the intellectual underpinnings for a lot of what was to come in the project. And it was also where I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Daniel Snail uh, from Harvard University. Uh, now, Dan Snail is a giant in deep history. Uh, his background is as a medievalist, um, and I think it's actually really fascinating to explore our different paths towards deep history, coming from medieval studies and coming from Indigenous history. And how they've shaped our thinking in, in different ways, but also in, in ways that converged. Uh, but Dan's work uh, is very diverse. It also explains to neurohistory. Recently, he's written on the history of compulsive hoarding. Uh, he's an incredibly creative thinker. Uh, it's been a real honour to engage with him and his ideas on this project. Uh, Dan's going to be followed by Neil Brown. Uh, and Neil is one of the PhD candidates on this project. His honours thesis looked at the deep history uh, of the Top End region and he spent years working up with communities around Gabaroo. Uh, but his doctoral thesis has taken him over to the Pilbara. He's doing some fascinating work revisiting 19th century paradigms for deep history. Uh, and I hope that he's not sticking to his abstract, uh, but I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be missing Josh this afternoon. Josh Newman, he's also one of the PhD candidates. Uh, his family has been struck down with a gastro bug, um, so he wasn't able to make it here in person. So we will have a little bit more time for questions. We're going to begin uh, with Dan, and then followed by Neil, and then we'll have a time for open questions at the end. Um, let's take it away, Dan. Um, hi everyone, Lauren. So good to see you again, and thanks for those really warm comments. Um, can I just check in? Is the audio coming across okay? Uh, does it sound good, Laura? Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, thank, thank you, Laura, for those, uh, <laughs> that very warm introduction, um, and, um, and for Benny for the, the, um, the invitation. It's just such a privilege to, to join all of you for this. Um, also, Emma and others for all our organizational efforts. I know it's like organizing these things, so we're, um, so I'm really grateful. Uh, it's, it's, I have to say it's really good to be back in Australia, uh, <laughs> even if I'm not really there. Um, so I mean, thanks to the to the sort of magic of, of what what uh, uh, the pandemic conditions to our customs of using um, Zoom. Um, so it's um, and, and thanks to all, all of you for coming. Um, so when when Ben and Amy reached out to me earlier this um, this fall and, um, and asked me to join, it's you know it's a real honor. Um, I, I was really thinking. I mean, one of the things that I was really thinking is that. I've learned so much more from you than, than I think has come the other direction. I'm just really wondering whether I can say anything that, uh, that would be helpful. So I, I, I've put together some remarks, really, that are I mean, kind of almost autobiographical in nature that have to do with, I, I think, just the evolution of my thinking in light of, of the kinds of things I've been learning um, from all of you, from the team that Anne and others have put together there, and from other colleagues. Um, let me let me begin with an with an anecdote um, which it took place in my department uh, probably about a decade ago. Um, a, a colleague in our department was pro uh, proposing a doctoral examination field, sort of a qualifying field um, in the indigenous history of North America. Um, that was a really um, amazing proposal. It was the first we had in our department in this field, and. Um, um, this colleague had put together a, a really robust and interesting bibliography and, and some really powerful explanations about um, to, to justify the field. And, um, so we all, all approved it enthusiastically. But it, it had one curious feature, and, and I, I don't think I kept the paperwork. I, I was looking through my files, I would have loved to actually confirm my impression, but, um, but I distinctly remember that one of the lines in the proposal said that this field in um, Native American history of North America will focus on the time period from 1492 to the present. 
Um, so I, to, toward, toward the very end of the discussion, I raised a hand and I just said innocently, um, do you think we could change this definition of the time frame uh, that constitutes the indigenous history of, the of, of North America? Then I got and explained a little bit about what my thinking was about this. Um, and what I recall is that the department voted to add an adverb um, to the proposal such that this field will focus substantially on the period from 1499. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking a little bit earlier if some people um, we really felt that the, the necessity for doing it. Um, so you, you, you'll get the point of this of this story right off the bat. I, I don't really have to explain it. Um, so the colleagues of my de department, first of all, are defining history in terms of textual evidence. That it, if you didn't have textual evidence, it doesn't it didn't count as history. And one of the things I remember in the discussion was that it was okay to use archaeological sources from the 16th century because it, by then we had some textual sources that sort of made the, uh, the archaeological sources legitimate. But before that, without the text, they, they didn't count um, kind of as history. Um, so, so the second thing that I think you'll all recognize is this, this, this latent idea that history is made by Europeans. Um, now, this is a really old idea that's been around since the time of, of the, the German historian Leopold von Blanke in the 19th century. Um, and I, I, I'm not a, a, you know, a, a historian of history per se. This is, uh, there's probably some of you in the audience who know this history better than I do. Um, but, but in effect, von Blanke and other people of his generation in, in, effect, in effect felt that history was a quality that only applied to European societies and civilizations, and all the other world societies and civilizations, among the favorite examples was, was China, um, which is caught in this endless rhythm of just cycling and cycling about without ever getting anywhere. And then the principle of this is only Europeans managed to break the grip of this ceaseless turnabout where you never got anywhere. Um, so again, that, that kind of lay behind this idea that, that North American history of indigenous people began in, in 1492. Um, so when I, when I first proposed, at least to print the idea of the deep history in 2008, um, one of the goals um, I, I, was, I was getting at was to invite a conversation about the, the span of human time that responsible historians ought to know about. Um, I, I myself distinguish deep, uh, deep history from big history, which I think of the latter as being a branch of physics, whereas deep history is, is, is just about people, it's about humanity. Um, I, I can say more about that in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, so the, the book that I wrote focused in largely on the, on the old world, and, and in effect I was looking at the legacy of um, what used to be the Western Civilization course, which was a very prominent course in the U.S. higher education curriculum. Um, for many years. Um, and one of the claims I was trying to make in the book is that, that the shallowness of the time frame, um, just this 6,000 year time frame, um, arose from the hidden legacy of the sacred history of Judeo Christian thought, according to which the world was itself was created about, about 6,000 years ago. Um, but um, so th that, in fact, what I, was trying to, what I was trying to do in the book. I, and just to let the cat out of the bag, there wasn't really any indigenous indigenous history on, on the horizon for me at that point. Um, but um, as someone who had grown up in the American high, um, educational system, it was clear to me that, that the idea of deep history had interesting implications for American history. And that's what's interesting about the, that's what's relevant about the anecdote that I just told. Um, because the, the shallow chronology of history as it existed oh, only a decade ago in my department, assumed that the peoples of what came to be known as North America didn't have a past that mattered to history. Um, they had an archaeology, but they didn't have a, a historical past. Um, and in case you're wondering, the person who proposed this field was herself an indigenous scholar of indigenous people of North America. Um, so it was, it was a really unusual um, statement about historicity. Um, so um, at the time um, when, when the, the, the first book that I wrote came out, um, I, I was thinking back on the, the number of, of social media type things that I wrote when people asked me to talk about it. No one ever asked, asked to talk to me about the, the, the implications for Native American people or indigenous history. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't on my mind. Um, it, as I was putting this together, I went back to some of the things that I had written 
Um, and then one of them I described my, my primary school education. Um, so I grew up in the state of Wisconsin, um, and Native American peoples were covered in our social studies class classes. And, and since I grew up in Wisconsin, that uh, this meant the uh, addition of the nation, uh, which at the time um, were known as Chippewa or Ojibwe. Um, but the addition of it didn't have a history, but what they had was a collection of timeless customs. I, I think you're all familiar with this timeless customs. Um, I remember going to a field trip to the State Historical Society Museum in Madison, Wisconsin, um, where we saw frozen dioramas of Anishinaabe people in living um, in the country. They, they showed the corn that they ate and the animals of the trap and things like that. But it was just frozen. It was just these frozen dioramas next to raccoons and opossums and, um, and, and, uh, and blue jays and things like that. Um, so we never had to memorize any dates associated with Anishinaabe. There was no time period. Um, and the state itself, the state of Wisconsin, came into the stream of history only when the first French voyagers um, arrived around 1622. Um, so it never would have occurred to any of us to ask what, what the Anishinaabe were doing in Wisconsin at the same time that the, you know, that the Romans were doing things in Rome. And just, they were completely bracketed. Um, so in that essay, I wrote a paragraph about what I understood to be the implications of deep history for, I guess, what I would call the politics of history, um, which was to bring North American peoples into history's field of vision. Um, and, and restored historicity uh, to the peoples without history. So you will all recognize the problem here. Um, the problem is that I was thinking about all this without bothering to consult the people from whom it might matter. So at the time, I didn't circulate among scholars of um, indigeneity. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm a historian of European history before 1600. Um, that history, going back to the Roman period and throughout the, the, the medieval period, um, is distinctly marked by settler colonial, colonialism. There's a lot of it in the Roman period, in the, in the, in the medieval so-called expansion of Europe. Um, but the field at the time wasn't in the habit of using the language of indigeneity to talk about this. Um, there, there's a really interesting article about um, Irish scholarship and about the, the reluctance of the Irish Irish scholars to use concepts of, of indigenous to talk about Irish peoples. That the author was arguing that, that a scholarship should do that, but the fact that she had to write this article was a sign of kind of a resistance to using it. It's, it's changing a little bit now, not, not a lot. Um, but I mentioned this because, um, because based on the field that I work in, there wasn't really any indigenous um, scholarship on the horizon. Um, so, so for me, um, the breakthrough really came in 2013, which is when Anne invited me to participate in the, in the conference that led to the publication of Long History, uh, Deep Time. Um, so Anne, if you're listening, I, I no longer have the email. Um, I was searching the email, I was looking for it. Um, um, but I remember being perplexed about why you would want me to come to the conference. I was thinking, boy, that sounds fascinating, but I'm sure I can contribute anything useful to this. Um, and of course, you all know Anne. Um, she ignored all this stuff and cheerfully put it on. Right? Um, and happily, I uh, uh, you know, accepted and came. Um, I had lived in Canberra in 1971 for a year, um, and I was really excited to visit it uh, uh, four decades uh, later. Um, so at that conference, I gave a totally forgettable paper. Um, but for my part, I was sucking up incredibly unfamiliar and fascinating things. Um, I have a lot of fascinating memories of the people I talked to. Um, if, you, if you were a fly on the wall of my conversations in subsequent years, you'd hear me telling anecdotes from that conference about the things that I was learning that kind of burned themselves into my, mem my memory. And above all, the papers that you all wrote were just, were just totally eye-opening. Um, so Andrew kind of asked me to read the papers and offer some thoughts, and that, that, that's that, that this first essay where we really began to think about this, the, the, the gift of history, as I call it. Um, and that particular essay gave me an opportunity um, to meditate on um, the, the gift of deep history that I, I thought I was giving, um, namely the premise um, that all the world's people, people are part of history. I mean, it seems like a nice gesture of welcome. You know, everyone belongs to history. Um, let's, let's find a way to do this. Um, so, um, but reading the articles um, uh, after the conference, the thing that really became clear to me 
used to swallow them up on the papers, is that the gift of history is, is not a gift that everyone is eager to receive. Um, so the title of the essay included a subtle play on words, um, because in Germanic languages, the word gift actually means poison. And etymologists have a number of theories as to why that's the case. Um, but anyone familiar um, with anthropology, in particular Marcel, Marcel Mauss, um, knows how gifts create subtle obligation, obligations and dependencies on the part of the, the, on those to whom the gift is given. The gifts are always political. They're not generous and open spirited the way that we think of gifts as being. Um, so that kind of explains this sort of gift poison um, connection. That that's kind of what I was getting at in that in that doula on the of, of the title of that essay. Um, so yeah, in that essay, I was especially interested in, in what the authors um, said about conceptions of time. I, I was reading back over it and thinking thinking through, um, um, and I, I was just fascinated by this by this paradox that came up in the papers about. Um, Essentially, how is it possible to say some to say that something is old and attached to the date to a thing when it is present in the here and now? What does it mean to fix things back in time when they're with us in the present? Um, and this is something that I've just been puzzling about constantly. Um, in my teaching in the deep history class that I teach now, I, um, I, I sometimes offer the example of the uh, Maka uh, Panska pebble that some of you may have heard about. It's, it's a pebble um, that is found in the context of uh, Australopiths in southern Africa about three million years ago. And it's a really interesting pebble because it looks like it has a human face on it. Although we know that the pebble was created by natural processes of, of erosion and, uh, or, or some kind. It, it's, it's completely environmental. So the pebble itself who knows how old it is? It came out of the stream tens of millions of years ago. But if you look, if you go and look for the Mata Panzia pebble on the website, you will see it dated to three million years ago, um, because that's the date when a human picked it up and and um, an Australian Austro picked it up. Um, <laughs> so in, in the, the conference that um, Laura and Ben organized, the conference, um, this was when I really got a chance to think more about why the gift might, might be poisonous. Um, so um, again, Ben and Laura, just, uh, this was a really, really amazing opportunity to get together with you and again, learn from everyone. Um, the, the, the gift of historicity, and, and I'm, partly, I'm partly pulling out things I learned from Ben and Laura's essay um, that they wrote from this time. Um, the gift of historicity unconsciously assumes that there is a single historicity. In other words, the one that's defined by European conception of time. Um, uh, Gustavo Verdesio's paper in that volume um, was particularly valuable for the manner in which he explored um, the additional complexities and paradoxes, things that I just hadn't been thinking about. Um, one of the really valuable things there um, was the manner in which universities commodify virtually everything that they touch, including knowledge. Um, and this made me think about the fact that you can, you can create a chair, a professorial chair in, in indigenous studies but when you do so, you, you turn indigenous knowledge into a commodity, something that can be listed at a curriculum vitae, so as to earn tenure or salary increases or academic plaudits, all the things that the currency of the state does. Um, so if one of the principles of indigenous knowledge is that it shouldn't be owned by any individual, which is one of the fundamental points that Anne pointed out in her own essay for that volume, that the gift of a chair in indigenous studies itself is, is theoretically unwelcome because it's, it's, it's uh, commodifying something that should be uncommodifiable. Uh, so as, a, as, you know, I'm a pragmatist, I would never recommend that such chairs not be created or accepted. Um, but I was just fascinated by learning about this, this paradox, this fundamental paradox. Um, so in 2018, um, I attended um, uh, a conference on decolonization in Schwerin in Germany. Um, and thanks to my prior experience with all of you, um, I actually knew uh, much more what was going on this time. Um, one, one thing that the papers from that conference helped clarify was the point that although the violence 
of settler colonialism has the appearance of being over and done with, um, that epistemological colonization is ongoing and just as, just as violent. Um, it was also uh, clear from the papers for that 2018 conference in Shui um, what we gain and what we lose by relying on the forms of evidence that are favored by Euro-American epistemology. Um, because um, th this is an approach to knowledge that has the effect of distancing the observer from the subject, um, where the people who are studying become them um, and they rather than um, us and we. Um, so um, the, um, the, this really made me realize how the technologies that make, excuse me, make the deep past visible to archaeologists, geneticists, and human evolutionary biologists have the paradoxical consequence of eroding our sense of identity with the people um, of the past. Um, so um, this made me realize that deep history approached this way, it extends the chronology of history, but it does so at the expense of human identity. It makes it difficult for the identities uh, to stretch back into time. Um, so um, I guess to summarize, we begin to summarize, it, it, it has become clear to me um, just in, over, these, over the years that, that deep history in the, in the light of indigenous thought um, is parochial rather than universal. I think that's the most the fundamental point here. Um, and this raises an important question about whether one should stop doing it. Um, so um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I teach an introductory class on deep history for first and second years um, at, the, at, at my university. And it's a quite popular course. Um, it would be more popular if we um, um, gave inflating grades rather than honest grades so they all deserve. But, um, <laughs> so we, um, I, I teach this with an archaeologist who think this is an introduction to the ways in which the deep past matters. Um, so along the way, um, in this course, both my co and I engage in repeated intervals with indigenous knowledge. We, we stop, we often take time from our lessons to, to describe things using the framework, some of the framework um, um, of indigenous, in, indigenous knowledge. Um, so we don't provide a proper introduction. Um, the students would need to take a course dedicated to the subject. Uh, but I'd like to think that, that this course is something that's actually sparking curiosity among some students um, and that they're going to follow up um, with learning about this, this field. Um, so I, I'd like to think that this is one really good reason for teaching a course like that. Um, I guess the most important point is that even if we accept the idea uh, that deep history is parochial rather than universal, um, it's still my own epistemology, it's because based on where I am, my, my intellectual tradition is the way I approach the past. Um, and, and my my conclusion here is my, the, the one I'm, I'm, I'm working at towards now, I'd be curious to hear what everyone thinks, is that as long as one respects the limits, its limits, and it's parochial rather than universal, then it's perfectly fine. It's a, it's a perfectly fine way um, to carry on one's historical studies. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to your, your, your talk, your thoughts. Well, thank you, Dan. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions in the question time. But then we'll throw it over to Neil. Uh, so, hi everyone, uh, my name's Neil, <coughs> and it's great to be here today and to see the launch of the Marking Country website on Wall <coughs> and Nambri Country, and to be part of the Yarning Circle last night and to hear different ideas about history. Um, and my apologies that I've had to change my talk from the abstract in the symposium paper there, but it just turned out to be a little bit too long. And I'd also like to say that if I had participated particularly in the yarning circle um, yesterday before I wrote the presentation, there are probably some ideas and things that I would have phrased and expressed differently. So I'm going to do a lot of clicking and hopefully I get that right in time with what I'm saying. <coughs> so I'm a PhD candidate in the Research Centre for Deep History and I applied to join the centre because of its stated aim to analyse Australia's epic Indigenous narratives alongside scientific evidence 
to create a big picture history of Australia in a wider global context. And I'm meaning that aim by writing a pre-contact history of the Pilbara using myth as primary data, situated in the context of global cognitive change. <clears throat> and today I'm going to talk about aspects of that in relation to time, space, deep and big history, where deep history means the history of the whole human past, and big history the whole period since creation. So this is the Pilbara in northwest Western Australia. As a governmental zone, the Pilbara extends um, all the way to the Northern Territory border, but the name is more frequently applied to the western part of that zone. And Pilbara is an unadulterated pre-contact indigenous word. And as a place name, it refers to a small area of land between Port Hedland and Karatha. And a creek in this location where Silver Bream or Bishbarara can be easily caught. And as an adjective, Pilbara means dry country, dehydrated and desiccated. <clears throat> Although the name implies dryness, the Pilbara is well watered and it's been inhabited continuously by Nada Ngali or Nada, Pilbara Aboriginal people since the beginning of time. And this is the kind of well watered gorge in the Chichester Range that acted as a refugia during the driest periods of the last 50,000 years. There's 23 language nations in my study area, and that makes up what I call the Pilbara block or Pilbara culture area. And there isn't time to say why 23 exactly, um, but it is derived from the region's mythology. And I became interested in the Pilbara um, and, the, and mythology while working as a park ranger at Millstream Chichester National Park in Indubani country. And these are These are just some of the places in and around the park. Um, and most of the photos I'm going to use today are, are my own. Um, I've made one trip back to the Pilbara since I started my candidacy. Um, and I had several more um, planned to consult on my research. Um, but COVID made that difficult, particularly with the Western Australian border closures. Um, but I have talked to several Pilbara Aboriginal organisations and senior knowledge holders about my research and they've been um, very supportive. So the reason I decided to use myth as primary data is because it's the only non-material testimony about the Pilbara's past. It's the best data to understand um, what happened, and it's equivalent with the traditional um, history's written documentation. <clears throat> Indeed, without myth, I believe that historians have effectively no access to the experience people had in the period preceding literacy, and yet myth is never used in contemporary Australian deep histories and rarely in global deep and big histories which use scientific data almost exclusively. And this exclusion of myth from deep history has a lot to do with the history of the word myth itself. So the original Greek ruthos meant simply speech, authority, pronouncement or story. <coughs> Homer the first person to write down Greek myths used muthos in the Iliad and the Odyssey to refer to specialised speech acts performed from memory indicating authority and stories about the past spoken during those speech acts. And so far this accords well with the primary meaning of the English word myth, a traditional story about the past involving supernatural beings. And what you can see in the example there is that the gods, in this case Zeus, um, they're involved in the affairs of humanity, and in this way, Muthos connects the divine lineages to human lineages and it extends history into deep time. And the mechanism for this backward temporal extension in Indo European mythology is the theogony or the history of the gods, a linear genealogy of the gods that tells the whole history of humanity, nature, and the cosmos reaching back to the eternally existing primordial time, chaos or void. And this is the Greek theogony, but different examples have existed across the whole, <coughs> the whole Indo-European language area, and they were understood as literal, true histories of the world. It was only three centuries after Homer that the myths describing the theogonies became associated with untruth, leading indirectly to the second and wrong meaning of the English word myth, a widely held but false belief or idea. 
And it was the father of history, Herodotus, who first used the word muthos pejoratively twice in histories to frame the muthos of Homer and Hesiod as unverifiable accounts of the past, an attitude extended in stronger form by Thucydides. And together they restricted admissible historical evidence to personal observation, eyewitness accounts and written documentation. Herodotus, for example, travels to Alexandrina and talks to some Egyptian priests and he accepts their genealogies of human kings as fact because they have written documentation, but he ignores the period preceding, um, preceding that written documentation which, during which they claim gods ruled the world. And using the genealogy of kings, Herodotus calculates history to be 11,340 years long, and this becomes his temporal limit. In the move anticipating deep history, or Bordel's long durée method, he supports his timeline by speculating about various hydrological processes related to siltation of the Nile Delta. Herodotus as such established parameters for admiss admissible historical evidence, and that excluded myth, and he linked that to an ability to quantitatively chronolo chronologize the past. Four centuries later, Diodorus Siculus extended Herodotus' historical method in his Universal History of the Mediterranean, the Bibliotheca Historica, and in it he excludes the whole period preceding the Trojan War, times talked about extensively in Greek myth, <coughs> claiming the antiquity of the events and the narratives of ancient mythology does not admit of the strictest kind of proof or disproof. For these reasons, the writers of greatest reputation among the later historians have stood aloof from the narration of the ancient mythology and have undertaken to record only the more recent events. And consequently, his history is only 1138 years long. It was the historical methods of the Greek historians, particularly the idea that myth is false testimony of the past, which ended the West's access to deep time for over 2,000 years and created the idea of prehistory as a space impenetrable to historical narrative. Later, the Old Testament shut off shut off primordial time or prehistory completely through the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. <coughs> to return to the Pilbara, there are at least two local terms for their traditional stories. The younger Mata called them Muwa Mungri Nilija, or words of the dreaming that are true, while the Injabani called them Wara Nurani Nujugamu, dream time story. <coughs> In these phrases, Muwa and Wanga translate as either speech or story, just like the original Greek mythos, that these words denote the same thing 3,000 years apart on different continents suggests Australians maintained a knowledge of the past expressed in a special kind of true story Europeans once understood but have since forgotten. So a myth is a special kind of true story about the past and I set about collecting them for the Pilbara from the published literature and I found 208 myths in 38 publications spanning 120 years, with 13 of the 23 nations represented and 42 named storytellers. And I call this the Pilbara Canon, and it works as my primary data. Um, and in the second chapter of my thesis, I do critique the Miss Collection content, uh, context, including mistreatment of the Nadangali by Europeans and about a dozen biographies of um, Pilbara storytellers. So these stories are still spoken within Nada communities today. The Injibandi, um, for example, recreate their wangas using giant puppets at community events, and several animations of Pilbara stories have been developed, and the Injibandi have a beautiful cultural centre with a map that shows all the stories, very similar to the Marking Country website um, we saw last night. But once I collected the myths, while it was obvious they were describing the Pilbara's past, the stories did not combine into a single continuous storyline. Indeed, the Pilbara canon doesn't contain even a history of the gods, such as the Indo-European theogenies, and with the exception of a first creator, it doesn't contain any anthrop anthropomorphic gods at all. The Pilbara canon has almost no linear sequential content whatsoever, and that's an initially perplexing situation for a prospective historian. And the following two stories show what I mean. And these examples are shortened for this presentation, but the Pilbara stories are short in general. So this myth, <coughs> shield-making by eagle, pair and owl, explains how owl 
found a shield and a sized it with a special design, which the Eagles approved of. The design carved by Al uh, is a zigzag motif unique to the Pilbara Woolmer shields, and it differentiates them from their neighbours, whose shields have different designs. And this, that, this myth is a statement of the human past or history. The second story, Put Put Stops the Sea, explains how the sea was flowing over the land and Put Put or Pheasant Kukul sent it back. And this story is a statement of the past of nature or what we call science and it possibly relates to the primary marine transgression or the mid-Holocene high stand. And the, the two myths tell us about the past, both natural and historical, but there's no way to determine what events, what order the events occur, if one is subordinate to the other, if they're in a causal relationship, or where they are situated in chronological time. This is because the events in the Pilgrim myths are distributed not linearly in time, but laterally in space, via objects of nature and culture. And the Marking Country website is a clear demonstration of this spatialization of Australian history via stories grounded in country. And this spatialization of history is why Aboriginal cosmology is sometimes said to be timeless. <coughs> so a tangent might help explain what I mean. In Newton's Principia, published in 1687, Time is an absolute attribute of the cosmos and it flows continuously at the same rate, independent of space. In Einstein's theory of relativity, published 300 years later, time becomes just one dimension of space-time, within which two observers in relative states of motion experience time differently. And in this situation, where time is fused with space, the faster you travel through space, the slower you move through time, and if you travel fast enough, time stops completely. Now, I'm not trying to make a complicated philosophical argument, but an analogy about history. The myths in the Pilbara Canon travel so fast, or so thoroughly in space, they've almost ceased to move through time, except as a function of change of space. By comparison, scientific deep history is Newtonian and treats time as an independent continuum, and this creates a methodological predilection to extract events from space and transpose them into time. Thus, the big historian David Christian describes a single historical continuum based on the results of radioactive decay dating as a framework for big history, a temporal continuum that's literally produced <laughs> by taking space out of country and pulverising it by a mass accelerator spectrometry to produce time. None of this means, however, that the Nalangali lack knowledge of empirical past time, calling the Pilbara Narani Mujugamu, or when the world was soft. Narani Mujugamu covers all elapsed past time except the last three generations of Narangali, but as the temporality in which the myth events occur, it conforms to the spatial structure of the Pilbara canon and lacks clear internal event sequences or quantitative time values, and it's something like the seasonal or cyclical time of nature. But I want to write a history of the Pilbara using myth as primary data that travels through both space and time. And while I acknowledge this carries epistemic risks to Nada epistemology, I believe it is worthwhile because a chronological history <coughs> can connect the contemporary community with traditions of their ancestors and show that these traditions were actual at discrete points of time. It may be able to assist in native title terminations, and it allows Nada historical judgment to come over into Western historical discipline and challenge Western concepts of what the world is, what it can be, and how we can talk about it. And although I was perplexed at first about how to do this, the myths themselves showed me how. <clears throat> A lot of the Pilbara stories are variants of one another. For example, there are nine variants of Put Put Stops the Sea. And by counting all variations of the same story, I ended up with 65 stories that are unique. I then mapped the distribution of all 208 myths um, across the Pilbara using the language affiliations of storytellers, and I found 16 of the 65 unique myths um, were spoken by three or more Pilbara nations, and I call these ecumenical myths, 
And 11 of the 13 nations with published myths um, speak one or more of those ecumenical myths. And since all but one of these myths is restricted to the Pilbara, they support the Pilbara as a cultural block on the basis of their mythology, indicating a shared spiritual life world whose development occurred in the past. As the Nipali elders attest, the stories and songs connect the Nipali people with their neighbours. From the ecumenical myths, I drive 12 cultural constituent groups representing core categories of knowledge content within Nada epistemology. For example, Put Put Stops the Sea created the category Sea Country, and all myths about the ocean go into that group. I then drive four consolidated themes directly, um, four consolidated team themes directly from the cultural constituent groups morality, creation, nature, and history and I arrange the cultural constituent groups inside them. For example, myths like Put Put Stopping the Sea that describe the formation of the environment but don't involve human activity are in nature, whereas those that involve human past events, uh, like Owl incising the shield, go into history. And I use the cultural constituent groups to develop a chronological history of the Pilbara and the four consolidated themes to situate that history in the context of global cognitive change. So although this process is a little more complicated than I've described today, it works as a lever to turn stories distributed in space into stories capable of narrative through time, <clears throat> but it does so organically on the basis of the myth's own distribution and content and maintains the spatial historical orientation and allows an art of historical testimony to determine what belongs in the history of the Pilbara. And I'd like to finish with a brief example of how the cultural constituent groups can work. So on the screen is a short and variant of the Pilbara origin of fire myth, the ecumenical myth of the cultural constituent group fire. And there's 11 variants in nine Pilbara languages, and in most of them, a refusal to share cooked food with wagtail causes him to steal the fire sticks and attempt to extinguish them in the ocean, at which time they're rescued by Garlamana, fire maker or peregrine falcon. And the myth explains the origin of the fire stick fire lighting method or intentional control of fire. And as an event of history, the myth has a double aspect. The third is the distribution of the myth itself. Why is it restricted to the Pilbara and how long have the Nadangali been telling this story? To explore this, I located 52 more fire myths within Australia and grouped them according to their narrative sequence and protagonist type, and the result was five clear cultural blocks. The Pilbara, plus Noongar with the Bandicoot, Kulin Nation with Bunjil, Gamilaroi and Naringiri with the Bird Corroboree, and Bini Gunwingu with the Crocodile, and these cultural blocks are still maintained today. There isn't time today to say how, but I developed chronological sequences from this fire myth distribution by correlating it with data from the historical sciences, particularly linguistics, to situate the Pilbara culture area in time. And I do this for every cultural constituent group at various scales to make a complete Pilbara timeline. This kind of historical comparative mythology is completely new in Australian studies. Like demonstrating, Australia is owned by 250 language nations overturned the idea of terra nullius. It demonstrates that Australia is not a land without epistemology or history, but the specialised knowledge systems, each with unique attributes, cover the whole continent, as is well demonstrated by the Marking Country website. <coughs> this comparative method, however, has a limit of about 4,000 years. To go deeper, it's necessary to examine the myth knowledge of past times directly. 46% of all Australian fire myths contain an explicit distinction between raw and cooked food. This distinction has been noted before, most famously by Cloud Levi Strauss, who argued all myths worldwide express an unconscious fear of the non-cultural state that would follow from loss of fire and cooked food. But his analysis didn't involve history, it was purely psychoanalytic. It's much easier, I think, to read the myths as situation-specific statements about the past than undertake structural bricolage. This was the approach of James Fraser in the 1930s, 
who used a comparative treatment of global fire myths to devise a three ages scheme of deep history. First there was a fireless age, then an age of fire used, and then an age of fire kindled, and this sequence is found in several Australian examples. Fraser appropriately treated myths as true statements about the past, but inappropriately regarded this as an accident. Fraser was a deep historian in the stable mode of the Enlightenment, which did use myth as historical testimony, and he wrote before major advancements in historical sciences, including William Libby's invention of carbon dating in 1948. Since that time, control of fire has become a prominent feature of Western deep history, and the paradigmatic work is Richard Wrangham's Catching Fire, but almost every general deep history work discusses the origin of fire. The shorthand argument is that control of fire and cooking of food beginning two million years ago initiated traits fundamental to the evolution of the human brain, body and social formations, and therefore culture itself. Daniel Lord Smale, who we're lucky enough to have as part of the symposium today, thus writes that recognisably human culture begins when war is first cooked. That's already what the myths are saying. The conclusion is, the traditional stories of Aboriginal Australians already are and always were deep and big history. And this is proved by not only fire, but all the cultural constituent groups being the same essential categories used by scientific deep historians. I could take the work of Alexander von Humboldt, H.G. Wells, David Christian, Colin Renfrew and Smale, and are uh, all deep histories using scientific data since 1845, and I found them to contain the same themes derived from the spatial distribution of the Pilgrim myths, and yet all these works repeat Herodotus's dictum that myth is not suitable for historical reconstruction. Pure scientific deep history is an appropriate historical method, but its attitude towards myth is misplaced. Not, uh, not only are myths artefacts from the past, which necessarily formed under historical processes, they are also knowledge of that past directly and constitute the testimony of the people who lived in it. To incorporate the testimony into narratives of deep time challenges us to overcome the Herodotian dictum and think more flexibly and laterally about so-called historical objectivity, including concepts of space and time. To finish on that point, you may have noticed today a lot of stories about birds. That's because 45% of all Pilgrim myths have bird people as protagonists. Pilgrim history is spatialised because it's fundamentally based on birds, which fly about in space and not the linear time of history. In the Pilgrim canon, birds are the coordinating conjunctions between the different wangas, and they function as a syntax of Pilgrim history, and this is stated directly by Nada historians themselves. Birds are part of Pilbara history in a way that the West has forgotten. The loss of this knowledge began at the same time Herodotus was changing the meaning of the word myth. Aristophanes understood the fading of this knowledge type and enacted it in his 414 BCE play uh, comedy, The Birds. To go back to the birds and the testimony of Australia's Indigenous custodians is to rediscover the historical modality that is and always was objective knowledge of the past. Thanks.